coolest contact on my phone. Or her. That could work. That could be a really cool contact. Yeah. 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 Should we FaceTime him? Should we see what he's doing? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Kanoe Garashi, just 22 years old, he came up as basically a child prodigy. The pursuit has started to fall, the pressure was mounting on the east shoulders, and, and that just, that right there just... Kanoe Garashi going to turns early on in the heat, getting the scores on the board early. That uh, small goal of wanting to be the best surfer uh, in my neighbourhood, and now I can say that I'm going to, I'm trying to be the best surfer in the world. <laughs> yeah, but buddy, that's like, a, that's almost like a religion. Yeah, and it, actually the funny thing was yeah, the only class I ever failed was a uh, physical education. Right. I hated sleeping. I mean, I, hate, I still hate sleeping. Now, that was the first time I actually even like put really? that into words, but it's crazy. Like, as a competitor, you lose a lot more than you win. I went into your Instagram and your on your last reels, you have a comment from Mark Zuckerberg, the <laughs> founder of... <laughs> who's that? Who's that? Yeah, who's that guy? Yeah. Oh. Guys, this is a good moment. The first ev episode of uh, Shaping Legends. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, the idea here is uh, basically a podcast in collaboration between Apex, investment uh, sports investment company, and uh, the Cron Creators, uh, one of the best, you know, I believe, create creative agencies out there. And basically, our idea is to, you know, to get inside elite athletes, understand their minds, understand basically what made them who they are and, and where they want to go in the future. So today we have the absolute pleasure of hosting a silver Olympic medalist, a descendant of Samurai Bloodline and a world top surfer, Kanoa Yagarasi. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's nice to be here with you guys. Um, I'll be on the first episode. We have John Lucena. Also, also thanks. a samurai. Thanks, Joao, for joining the podcast. I think you are an important person behind the Shaping Legends uh, podcast or working with, with a legend as, as Kanoa. Uh, so, yeah, and, let's and talk a little Apex, bit. Guys, and with Apex. Very and important with, to know. He's with to the note. Apex team. And also exactly. Doing my best, doing my best. <laughs> let's not put the, too much pressure on me. He's the middle <laughs> guy. That's why he's in the middle. So, you're yeah. a professional. Exactly. Professional middle guy. Professional middle Olympic silver medalist, no? Yeah. Well, yeah, we can put it that way. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about how we all got here. So, the connection. I remember the first time we worked with you guys. Uh, we got a connection through a friend in common, with yeah. Joao. And then we worked with Kanoa uh, on a content activation around the Milwaukee Bucks in 2021. I think you guys did a video from Pipeline in Hawaii. And, yeah, we did, like... <laughs> Uh, an ideation, fast ideation, uh, you had a filmer there and, and they filmed the content. It worked out pretty pretty well and then I think they won Milwaukee Bucks in that year they won the NBA, so mm -hmm. NBA champions. So yeah, you have also a lucky charm there, Kanoa. Um, and yeah, let's talk about a, a little bit about pre-professional career. Yeah, you know, it's really, yeah, first of all, it's really cool to, to be here and, and uh, connect with you guys. I feel like we all have a, what we have in common here is that we, you know, we all have the same goal. We, we all have a, we are all striving to, to be the best in what we do. Everyone's um, doing something a little bit different, but we're all working towards a, um, a big goal of, of being the best in our area. Um, and I love um, just being in the presence and being around uh, people that, uh, are very driven and, and um, obviously you know very very good at what they do in their in their area but also at the same time you know can can have a, a good time and, and have a, a good coffee or whatever after and you know it's all good so mm -hmm. yeah I mean for me I um, I started you know surfing when I was three years old um, you know my dad was a was a surfer and you know I never had dreams of uh, becoming a world champion or an Olympic medalist when I was three but you know, slowly as you go, you know, you, you, I, you know, my evolution was I, I wanted to be the best um, uh, surfer in my neighborhood. And then from that, I wanted to be the best surfer in my class at school. And then I wanted to be the best surfer um, in, the, in the city from Huntington. And then yeah. it was, you know, best in California. And that was like my, my goals leading up um, and slowly, and slow, slowly um, to now where, you know, that, that uh, small goal of wanting to be the best surfer uh, in my neighborhood, and now I can say that I'm going to, I'm trying to be the best surfer in the world. Um, so that, 
small goal just kind of snowballed uh, little by little. And uh, here we are now. I mean, you know, just uh, I feel like I'm at the I'm still at the start of my career. So it's it's crazy to talk about, you know, how I started because I feel like I'm starting now. But um, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah, well, saying that, like for people that don't know you and of course we know who you are right now, but uh, your parents are from Tokyo and you when you were born, they decided to move to California to Huntington Beach. Why? Why is that? Yeah, they uh, yeah they moved um, from Japan to to California. Um, they they wanted to give you know me the best opportunity to to um, to be a, a professional surfer. Um, you know they they never really wanted to push anything on me, but they wanted to make sure that I'm in the right environment. And uh, I mean, being in California was a lot more. I had a I guess a higher ceiling. Um, and I had a lot more, you know, competition around me, and uh, so yeah, they moved. They made that move before I was even born, which was really crazy to, to, to think, you know. And, and because of them, I have a U.S. passport. And because of them, I have uh, I got all these opportunities to be around um, amazing people that kind of shaped my career to to where I am right now. And and just you know, since we're speaking geographies, you also have a good connection with Portugal. Indirectly, that's how you know we met and how we know each other. Of course, we worked through through Apex, but you know before that, we we were friends. We we're all part of the same, uh, you know, the same region in Portugal. Why why Portugal? How did that come, you know, to 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 your life as well? Yeah, I mean, it's so crazy that you say that. Uh, I mean, nowadays, um, I mean, I feel like back in the day, you know, like you know, uh, growing up, people are very divided by countries. They're very divi divided by borders and and um and stuff but nowadays i feel like it's you know we're all uh, you know someone can be from spain someone can be from portugal i can be from japan or california but you know it um no one judges each other off of that ever it's it's all it's all open you know everyone can connect and stuff so it's really cool uh to be in a generation like we are right now where um yeah i get to talk about yeah i'm from you know california I speak uh, Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish, and English, um, but I have a house in Portugal, yeah. and it's and it's not that crazy, you know. It's kind of like, oh, that's cool, you know. That's a cool, cool blend. Um, but I started coming to Portugal um, from a surf comp. Uh, my first time to Portugal was a surf competition, and then um, I really uh, just fell in love with the the culture. Um, and there's night waves. There's good yeah, waves good waves there. No, yeah. the waves are all good, but I mean the thing is, you can get good waves anywhere in the world, you know. It's not it wasn't just because of that. I, um, I had a really good experience of just um, being a part of the culture and there's so many, I mean, growing up in California for, you know, uh, probably 16, 17 years and I started going to Portugal when I was 16, 17, you, you know, I obviously my, my whole world just kind of like uh, opened up to a different, um, in a different way. I traveled all my life, but to be in one place and, you know, making friends and, and um, living the lifestyle I did in Portugal, uh, I met, you know, those years, 16, 17, 18, I met some of my best friends, um, and, and, and Joao was one of them. And, you know, that kind of, you know, really shaped me to be who I am today, just uh, yeah. being around, uh, you know, good friends, and, and then uh, obviously being able to surf, and it was a really cool mix yeah. of, of everything. My whole world was very, like, in a nice compact place yeah, there, yeah. and so but, keep coming yeah, back. The, Portu the Portuguese culture is, is actually very welcoming. I think this is something that I actually noticed, you know, also traveling the world people always have great things to say about portugal and we're very welcoming and I, it's really cool that you feel at home there right and that's and i speak portuguese it's it's so cool to see and you know the, the friends that we all have in common but going a bit more into those origins you know let's call it your earlier earlier origins you know we've we've read somewhere that your your great grandfather was a sword a sword master if that's how you say it um can you tell us a bit more about that and then on top where does the name canoa come from uh, yeah, like I said before, I'm, I'm very, I'm a very, um, I guess, international um, um, person. You know, my both both sides of my family actually, um, both sides of my ancestry, they, they have samurai backgrounds, um, and um, uh, my name Kanoa means uh, freedom okay. in Hawaiian. Nice. So my name is actually Hawaiian. Um, okay. Just because my, I have no connection with Hawaii, but my parents really like Hawaii, uh, and they really like the name, being free, free, and being the free one, and 
and uh, you know, being, I guess, uh, not having any borders, not having any boundaries. Um, and that's kind of how I feel like I, I live on a daily, daily basis. And then my last name, Igarashi, in Japanese means uh, 50 storms. So means what, sorry? 50 storms. Ah, nice, nice. So that's why I, I use the number 50 on my jersey. You could uh, create a brand with that, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I could. That could, that, could be, that, yeah, that could be a conversation <laughs> outside of the podcast. That sounds really good, actually. <laughs> here, it started right here. But, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, so I'm the free one, 50 storms. You know, I, I, whenever I wear my jersey, I have the 50 on my back. I, I feel like I'm representing my family uh, and my samurai, um, I guess, background, samurai history. Hmm. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a huge honor. Obviously, everyone has their, their number, and it means something special to them, and that's my, that's my special. Awesome. And going back to the Portugal thing, like, how did you guys end up working together? Because, like, uh, I've been working a lot with athletes these past years uh, with, the, with the agency. But and I know it's really important, the whole team that is behind the, the athlete or the people, that, the circle behind it and the circle they trust. So how did you guys end up uh, working together? Like, well, I guess, like Kano said, we've become really good friends over time. And I, don't know, I was in the hotel business world. And I used to help him out with, like, I don't know, man, small deals here and there with hotels whenever he would come to Portugal. And our relationship grew organically. And eventually, one day, he invited me. And I quit my job. I think <laughs> two days afterwards, no, 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 without no, no. even knowing if it was confirmed. No, no, but no, was, no. The thing was, it was like it was actually he didn't tell the story very well, but it was just like a super. Well, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't give them, you know. But the yeah. thing is, it's like we were just really close friends, and you know? we were super close friends. We were together every single day, and I and I was pissed that he went. He was going to work every day. Really, I mean, I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. kind of what it was. It was like we were, you know, we, we wanted to hang out, but it was he was going to work every day. And he was actually staying at the hotel I was working at, yeah. at the Intercontinental. Yeah, exactly, so, in Cash Cash. And yeah. so, but he was working, and I would be like, you know, I would surf alone all day, and I'd just be like, wow, like, you know, I, I, you know, John gets off work at five or six, whatever, and then we go, we can go do something after. But, uh, and it was just like, okay, hey, you know, enough of like you're know, working all day, whatever. Like, let's figure something out. It was like we had no plan, but we we're like, hey, yeah. I'll figure out a way where we can make something work. And all of a sudden, he's like, all right, I quit my job. And I'm like, all right, uh, let me figure something out. Let me figure and something I out. I flew to California. I stayed there for two weeks. And that's where we figured things out. Yeah. So it was completely freestyle. But then, nice. you yeah, know, fast yeah. forward, you know, five, six years, it's kind of like, okay, like now it makes total sense. You know, like we were little, we were like kids back then, just like, oh, this sounds cool. <sighs> but now it's like, well, we had a vision, you know, even though it was completely freestyle. Yeah. We had a vision and then it kind of, I feel like that's the future of, um, of uh, I guess, sports management too. And also for an athlete, you know, because you need someone that you can trust and need someone that's, someone that's in yeah. your corner, you know, that, that you can hear, you know, opinions, you can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, go back and forth with and have someone that can, that can speak your language, not literally a language, but speak your language towards a, a brand or a company Be in and, the same and, yeah, frequency exactly so it's actually it's really nice to to have that kind of um connection that i have with, with joel yeah and it's cool that you guys that you went with it with the feeling sometimes you need to jump at things right i, I, I always say that things in life they it's never the right moment to do something right it's because yeah. there's always something that holds you back in doing it and mm -hmm. sometimes you just got to go for it you know luckily when we're young, we can do it more. There's a bit less responsibilities, but we should we should use that to our advantage. And, and you mm -hmm. know, and I think clearly the it's it's been it's been worth it. And speaking about you know, you're, you're mentioning you know, at, at the age you were still very young and maybe still in school, going to your school days, what were you know what was that like? And you know, Wait. any particular subjects that you were good or bad before that? <laughs> I heard that you you used to wake up like 5:45 to go surfing before school. Yeah, that was yeah, that was, yeah, exactly. Um, that was how my, was that feeling? <laughs> and that was my routine. So it was like, uh, I mean, nowadays, you know, if, if someone tells me, "Hey, tomorrow at five forty-five, we're gonna be going surfing or whatever," it's like, okay, like, it's tough. Let's do it though, you know, because I'm used to waking up at seven. You know, when I'm in Europe, I wake up at seven, seven thirty. When I'm in California, I wake a little bit earlier. But um, five forty-five for me was like kind of late. You know, I would, I would wake up at maybe five and then like get ready, watch some TV and go serve at 5.45. 
Um, I don't even know what's on TV at that time, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't I guess, even want to know. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was no, but I was a kid, just like I don't know, like just wake up excited to be up, you know. Like, oh, of course, I hated sleeping. I mean, I hate, I still hate sleeping, but I was up. Like, I was so excited to go surfing every single day because um, I knew from 8:30 I had to be at school. So that moment from five until 8:30 was my freedom time. And then school was like, okay, whatever. Yeah. But everyone does it, and then I'm free again after three o'clock, you know. So. That morning was super important, and that was the time I got to spend with my dad. You know, my dad used to work at a uh, at a restaurant. He mm-hmm. was a manager at a restaurant, so um, and I would never, I wouldn't see him after school because he would come back late. Um, so the time I got to spend with my dad was that morning, from five until eight, yeah. uh, seven thirty, and so so it was like father son time. Plus, yeah. I got to surf, so it was like the best part of my day. So it was easy for me. Yeah. So that question should go to your dad. How did he manage to work at night and wake up with you at exactly. five? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now that was the first time I actually even like put realized. that into words. But it's yeah. crazy. Like yeah. he would come home probably around uh, midnight, you know, every day. And then the restaurant business is, is yeah, it goes until late. I mean, here in here in Madrid, it would be until 4 a.m. Maybe the restaurant <laughs> business, but, but here he would he wouldn't be able to yeah, sleep. Yeah, at all. yeah, he wouldn't. Yeah, if you guys come later, yeah, uh, yeah. from Portugal, it, then exactly. we end up late. Yeah, so <laughs> thank, thankfully we didn't grow up here in, in Europe. He wouldn't sleep, but in California, yeah, he'd get back home around 12 midnight. You know, 12:30. Yeah, and well, I mean, he probably, yeah, he woke up. He slept maybe four or five hours a day, really, and um, and he never, but he never showed it. That's why. He never showed that he was tired. tired. He never, I'm sure he was super tired, but every day he was ready 5.30 to go with me. And sometimes he would wake me up. And, and, um, and that's, I feel like, the, uh, the dedication and the sacrifice that he made, that obviously, to his own life. You know, I'm yeah. sure he was super tired. Uh, I know some of his close friends uh, that I'm friends with as well said that he used to, like, on his breaks at, at, um, at the restaurant, he would sleep in the office and stuff. Oh. So now that makes sense, you know, now yeah. I see that. And so, um, you know, that's where I get a lot of my, um, I guess, my drive and motivation as well. Nice. That's super important. Family. Yeah. Uh, And regarding the the question. The school, basically. The school question. What was your, you know, what were you, you, I assume you you got to school already tired, right? With this crazy mornings you would have. And of course, with all the passion with surf, but, you know, you had to still do it. What was, what was that like? Any subjects you hated in particular? Uh, I mean, you know, in school, um, school was actually, you know, what's crazy people don't realize was uh, my dad was kind of the, my surf side and my mom was very strict on school. So uh, it was like in my house, it was school was the first priority. And when I have everything done, I can go surf. Yeah, can. So that was like the, my our rhythm. And so school for me, I had huge respect for school. Um, I, ha- I had huge respect for school. Um, and... Serving was a treat, you yeah, know, yeah. serving was my, my getaway, was when I got to, you know, get out of my class and get my, my, my homework done and ready. But out of all my classes, um, I had really, really good grades. I always had, my mom didn't let me have anything under uh, like a, a straight A's. Yeah, without that, you wouldn't serve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I always had straight A's. I always was in, uh, in English, you say, honor classes, which is like the, you know, um, the, like the, the higher level of that grade, uh, that, the one classroom that was, you know, higher grade. And I, uh, but the one class, I, I've only ever failed one class in my life. And the one class was PE, which is physical education. Yeah. No yeah. way. No. Yeah, way. It was, let me see. Fair, we need some help. <laughs> yeah. We have the, our bodyguard and, yeah. and content yeah. samurai here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's a Rubicon bodyguard. <laughs> Fair, maybe you have to come tonight to... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> after hours. <laughs> okay, gracias. Um, yeah, and actually the funny thing was, yeah, the only class I ever failed was uh, physical education, which is probably the one class I should never fail. Exactly. Um, but I... Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times during that period where... And, and that was the one class that my mom was easy on me about. Yeah. Because she said that I don't care if you run fast, I don't care if you... If you play baseball or whatever, because during the PE, you play baseball, you, you play soccer. You already serve super good, so yeah, exactly. why, why I, are you going to yeah. run fast? <laughs> yeah, and uh, a lot of the teachers, they knew I surfed, but they were like, hey, but, you know, during that 45-minute class, you have to run. You have to, you know, and I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't want to run. I don't want to <laughs> play baseball, you know. 
so I had a couple of friends that during that class we'd always skip and we would go yeah. do something else and so whatever. But I failed that class. But other than that, I had good grades. So um, was a pretty good student. So it's not a surprise now that that you are going to Harvard to the crossover <laughs> into business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, thankfully, Harvard. I'm, I'm not doing any PE there, any physical education, but. Um, yeah, I'm in a Harvard uh, crossover program right now. It's um, it's been a great experience. You know, it's been uh, only a few weeks in, but I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm in a stage in my career right now where uh, I realize that as athletes, um, it's really important. And this is something that uh, you know you've taught me a lot. And the team at Apex have taught me a lot. Is um, you know, I mean, indirectly they're teaching me. You know, but I've realized that as athletes, we have so much. Um, um, I guess opportunity and so much um, room for growth in so many different aspects mm -hmm. that um, I feel very, um, I have these amazing opportunities around me. I want to make sure I, I get, grab hold of them and, and um, you know, I don't want to regret anything in 20 years where I'm like, wow, now is the time to do it. But I'm like, wow, I, I, yeah. that might, the peak of yeah. my career was 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, I don't want to have those thoughts. So I want to make sure. And this isn't about even financially. This is about just personal, like personal goals. Yeah. Um, and I want to, and I want to make sure that I have all these opportunities and get to be a part of these um, amazing startups and be a part of these amazing um, growing uh, companies. Um, and so for me, Harvard was a way to kind of, it was like the catalyst. It was like what brought everything together. It was it was kind of, Apex brought me everything, brought everything together for me, together for me. But I feel like getting that business uh, degree in Harvard was like. Just me leveling up that one, yeah. um, and I want I wanted to make sure that I, I tick that box um, to to be able to make you know even better decisions and being even more respected in that world. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I mean we'll go we'll go a bit more in, in detail in that uh, later, but uh, but yeah, I mean it's good that you realize, and for us as Apex, it's it's always about you know athletes understanding that the moment they should start in leveraging their platform and their opportunities is exactly when they're in the peak of their careers, right? And then we'll go, we can go out about it and explain it and you'll share your experiences. But speaking of peak of your career, I know I can say that, and it's, I'm sure it's something you're super proud of, And but uh, a moment that probably changed your life, you know, was your Olympic experience and, and you know, reaching silver medal in Japan, you know, representing your country, your origins. Um, tell us a little bit about it. You know, uh, go as you know to, to as much detail as you want. But I'm sure that that was quite unique. Tell us about it. Yeah, the Olympic experience was really one of a kind. You know, I never, I never had a goal of being in the Olympics. I never had a goal of getting a medal. Um, just because it was almost uh, too out of reach. You know? exactly. I, mean, I, I surfing was never in the Olympics, so it was. Um, hmm. You know, I would watch the Olympics. Ah, that's cool. You know, but I was never watching it like, wow, I wish, I hope one day I have a medal. No, it was like too too far away. Uh, and so when that moment came, it all, it all happened so quick. Yeah. You know, it was like all of a sudden, Olympic surfing got um, uh, selected to the, be in the Olympics, and then all of a sudden I'm training, and then I, I got selected, to, uh, I got qualified for the team. And then I'm in Japan and then it's over. I have a medal. <laughs> it was like, it felt like 15 days, yeah. even though it was four or five years. And it was in the, in the beach that your, your dad used to surf. Yeah, like, it was in the beach that my dad grew up surfing. He, he named that beach with his friends no? and he called it the dojo or the something dojo, like that. Yeah. <laughs> the, do, the dojo <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. And the dojo in Japanese means uh, like the gym, you know, like it's where the, kara, the karate and um, judo, you go there, you go to the dojo. So you go to so the it's gym. a tough place to surf or like, yeah it was just because it was like um there was two jetties and it, it looked like a, a gym because okay, it was okay. like yeah they had maybe 400 meters of beach there between the two jetties and so the, that middle area was the training ground so they called they called it the dojo and all of a sudden that you know, the place the, the gym the dojo became uh, the olympic venue so it was a very crazy moment Fuck. and then well and then i mean yeah crazy moment was then obviously fast forward I have a, a medal, I have a silver medal. I had crazy mixed emotions of, um, you know, being so close to a gold medal, which is so, such a great yeah. achievement. But at the same time, being so upset as a competitor, you always want to be first, you always want to win. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and me having a silver medal, it was, I was so upset, but at the same time, so proud. It was a very crazy mixed emotion feeling. Um, but, you know, I guess fast forward six months later, it was like, wow, okay, yeah. that was... But what you're saying, you're still, you know, 
early days in your career, right? And I'm sure you, you, you already have coming up in, in one year, you can go for the goals and then yeah. LA, so also a home for you in 28. So, yeah. but speaking about competing and competition, um, I'm, I mean, I was gonna, I was going to say I'm sure, but maybe I'm not sure. But what was the most, you know, what is the most difficult moment in your career competitive wise? Is there a particular um, moment in, in the tour that is always tougher? Was there a particular event that is in your memory? Tell us a bit more about, you know, a very tough competitive moment for you in your career. Uh, well, I've had a lot of tough moments. <laughs> you know, I think as, as a competitor, you lose a lot more than you win. Uh, yeah. I think all athletes understand understand that language. Uh, yeah, and like when I yeah injured, injured myself when I was 14, 15, that was very tough. Um, this year was actually really tough. I learned a lot, you know, like, like Joel saw, you know, like how, yeah. how tough it was for me, like just coming off such a big two years. You know, I had Olympic silver medalist. I made the top five last year. Yeah. It's hard to maintain like at a very high level for a long time. And so... This year was a really important like transitional year for me. It was a year where, okay, I have to like reset. The Olympics are over, top five goal is done. Now I have to kind of take a step back. I have to fig reset and figure out which coach I'm going to go with, with which boards I'm going to ride. It was like a transitional year where I knew actually that my results weren't going to be good, but I knew for the long run, it was going to be a very big, um, big turning point. So really the results were actually kind of Um, the second priority this year, yeah. but it was tough. You know, it's hard to you know. And you also that. you changed a lot of things, and I think you found a lot of like balance. Yeah. Throughout like, all these changes that happened throughout the year. Yeah, I so learned. I learned a lot, and you saw it, like, and yeah. Joao was there, like, at, you know, he saw it from a first hand, like. A, a, What is the first thing that you changed, like? Coach, uh, uh, coach. Oh, you can start by the coach, yeah. Which is you know. Which is a huge big part. One. Which huge is a big part. Change, yeah. yeah, for any any sport, you know, a coach is, is your is your. Uh, Yeah, but engine it, sometimes. But I think it's it depends on the sport. But like in Formula One, you don't have like an F1 coach. You mm. have like a physical coach. No, so some guys have, have some guys have. Um, yeah, they but, revise no, but, data I, and all no, that. But, but, but here, like your a, coach is a surfer, no? Or yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But like it's like in F1, it's like it's like it's like changing your management. Yeah. Changing your. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, changing the the pits the pits up team, the crew. Mm. Someone in the crew changes, like the management, mm. which is a, a big yeah. deal. It's kind of like well, I was so used to, un, you know, creating strategies with one person, mm. one coach, and then all of a sudden I'm creating strategies with someone yeah. new. And sometimes it's not even about the technicality of it. It's about him having confidence in this guy that's coaching him, and trusting his decisions. Exactly. Yeah. The trust. Yeah, that's the hardest part. For like the trust of like right. trusting that person. Uh, and then so I changed, I had like three coaches this year. Um, wow. Yeah, and I was kind of going through and, and just understanding what I wanted, what I needed. And then in the middle of the year, I... I, uh, I But you always had coaches or... Did you I've always, always had coaches, had. yeah. I've always had coaches my whole career. I had one coach uh, from when I was like 15, 14, 15 until I was 20, 20 21. Mm -hmm. So that was a long one. That was my one of my main first coaches. Which is like a second dad for you, yeah. even to these days. Yeah. Jake Patterson, yeah. and then I had a coach Tom Whitaker from 22 until I was 20. Yeah, until last year, 24, 25, and then yeah, and then so it was kind of like okay, now I'm ready for like the next chapter, next step, um, and then so yeah, the, the, this year was that year where I'm like okay, let's yeah. see what I can do in that aspect in the you know in the in the back because. People only see what I, what I'm doing in the water, but people yeah. don't realize what's happening yeah, in, in inside, behind, back, the behind the scenes, which is coaches, uh, nutritionist, co uh, trainer, um, yeah, what, know, mental what, coach. What rituals do you have, like, when you go into a competition or to into a contest? Like, I'm sure you have like a ritual that you, or like how yeah. do you? Yeah, no, I mean it's, it's, you would know more. I mean, yeah, it's it's super mellow, like. Yeah. Honestly, we have, say, it's a day of competition. You'll have an early morning surf. Then we'll have whatever, breakfast. In the, same, in the same way, early. like the early morning surf is in the same way. It doesn't spot. have to be. I just want to be like... Yeah, you know, just want to get his feet wet. What, like going in the water wakes me up. 
but no, no sort smoothie, of that's, but no that's routine sure. yeah so smoothie like any yeah. special song that you yeah. want to put before there is anything no? like crazy uh, conejito malo no si sí, but, <laughs> yeah, but buddy, that's like a, that's almost like a religion <laughs> yeah, it's more than you, a routine you, ra- you you actually have the letter of Bad Bunny on yeah, some yeah, of yeah. your boards no? he does yeah. Yeah. no I like I like the idea of like art and bringing your personality in the water too mm. um, everybody has white boards um, and I wrote some lyrics on my boards it was super fun actually um It was a song that I was listening to a lot that week, and I was like, oh, excellent, I'm going to write something. So I did like eight boards with some lyrics. Um, but then, yeah, there's, I don't have, I'm not like a very superstitious guy. Like, I don't, like, I'm not a, yeah. I'm not a guy where, I'm not an athlete where I'm like, oh, I, I need this, or yeah. I need that, I need to do this, you know? Uh, I want to make sure that my, when I'm competing, it's as similar as my normal, normal days as possible. And the decisions of writing for, uh, like, to take one surfboard or, or other, Is it based like on contracts? Is it based on performance? Like, how do you choose with what board you are gonna ride? Uh, it really just bases on. Uh, it's all my decisions. I have. Uh, I normally take about 12 to 16 boards per contest. Sometimes more. Uh, yeah, sometimes <laughs> more. He helps me take. Uh, yeah, he makes his legs strong and his arms strong from carrying the boards. Yeah. We're both in the airport, like carrying <laughs> so many boards. Um, but then from there, it's kind of like okay. We get there five days before the contest. Every day, I slowly filter the boards. The day before the contest, I have four or five boards that I know it's going to be like... Again, another part where the coach means a lot, you know? Yeah. He's you the see. one checking the surf footage with Kanoa, telling him, oh, okay, this board looks good, this board doesn't look so good. And then on the competition day, the coach can tell him which board to ride. Exactly. And it's what you're saying. It's, it's, it's that trust element, right? There's, yeah. I think every sport... Um, reaches a level of competitiveness which is so tough right yeah. where of course there's talent there's luck there's you know whatever happens in the sea but the more things you can have you if you feel that you're comfortable the better you can then you know uh, execute when you're there and having someone sometimes that can tell you go with this board trust me and you actually trust mm-hmm. and that gives you a stability and a confidence right that then confidence. can be the difference between you know yeah. two points three points and you know, as we know surfing is very You know, it's a tough sport because it's not really mathematical, right? Mm-hmm. It's, and it can be, so you need to be with, with your header. And, and speaking about, you know, again, competing and, and, and we talked about tougher moments that you had this year. Uh, is there any particular a heat, you know, again, a competition maybe, but a heat that is in your mind as a, an amazing heat that, you know, is with your mind, in your mind as a great memory? Um, yeah, I, I have a, a bunch, but... You know, I guess the, the one that comes out and stands out the most, the first one that comes up is my semifinal heat with Gabriel Medina um, at uh, the Olympics. Yeah, the Olympics. You know, uh, the fact that it was the Olympics, the fact that, you know, he was a, the, the uh, world defending champion. world champ yeah. at the time. Uh, he was probably the favorite, one of the favorites to, to win the whole thing. Um, and he had, he did his classic thing. He started big numbers. He had, you know, maybe a couple of eights, nines. Uh, and I was fighting back, you know, I had an eight myself and then there was two, three minutes left and, you know, I had this kind of, not a miracle wave, but a wave that kind of had that look yeah. and I was like, maybe this is something that... And I you knew it? Do you, you know it before you went for it? That, it? that it could be your shot? I knew what I needed to do yeah. and I knew what I wanted to do. And so when the wave came, I said, here, here's my chance. Amazing. But man, the thing is, he had to go really, really big to make the score that he needed to and you went for it and he... He yeah. actually like he you're, landed. You're you were risking over. a lot, no? Yeah, yeah it like, was like for me, it was like a, a move that like it was one of, it was one of the best errors I've ever done. Like one of the biggest errors that when I'm training, it's like that's like in your, the most important heat of his life. Well, that's like what you're like <laughs> aiming for the top. You know, yeah. your top. You give your hundred, but that's your all out. And so for me, I was like, I'm going for like my all out right now. Yeah. And if it sticks, sweet. If it doesn't, and, um, you know, and I, how how is that feeling when you land that? Trick? It was a crazy. It was a crazy feeling because it was kind of like. Like I landed it and I just felt the, the energy of yeah. the energy was there's no people on the beach because it was yeah. uh, the, during COVID. But I knew the, <laughs> I knew everyone went crazy. It was a huge moment. I can feel the energy of my parents. I can feel the energy of my friends. So All cool. my friends have their own story of what when they watch that yeah. wave, when that moment ha- happened, everyone because it was 3 a.m. in Portugal, 4 a.m. Yeah. All my friends were watching and everyone had their own reaction. And it's funny to hear all the stories of like, you know, I have a friend telling me they woke his, he woke up his whole family in the house. He was screaming. Exactly. I had another one that thought that their, the neighbors thought that the, there was an, a burglar in the house because they were screaming, you know. And so 
th those are the moments that, that I live for. Those are the moments where, you know, two weeks after the contest, I get to talk with my friends and I see their point of view on that moment. But for me, it was like this crazy moment where I knew a lot of the hard work was paying off in that moment. Insane. Yeah, yep. yeah like I, as you know, I work a lot with, with Carlos, the F1 driver, and every time we are in a race or like, even I watch it for home or whatever, we have a, a WhatsApp group with where is Carlos and everybody's commenting like live, fuck this race, let's, let's do this with the tires, let's do and then he wins and then the WhatsApp group is completely crazy, you know, it's yeah. nuts and everyone is talking how they live the race, how, and it's crazy. And then Carlos loved it to like then chat with his friends, like how they live that moment. And yeah, and, how, and he goes and checks it out. Yeah. Like, like, you know, what were they saying at that moment, right? Yeah. And, 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 and things like that. And then moving a bit more into, you know, there's the other side of, of being an athlete as well, which, you know, which is the commercial side, right? And you have a big, a big deal with, with Red Bull and, and, and Quicksilver. How do you, you know, how do these partnerships uh, come, come to, to, to life? And, you know, how, has your experience been good? Yeah, I mean, thankfully, we live in a world where um, a lot of these brands they really believe in uh and athletes in sports for for marketing you know you have a brand like um, red bull they could maybe not care about sports I mean, they they you know i know like more than half of their sales are are done uh in nightlife you know in mm. in in in, exactly. in clubs in, in bars gas stations gas well, stations yeah, like the, yeah you know like the, festivals yeah. yeah festivals so for them like it's not a uh, sports is maybe not a big market for them but they see something in, in athletes and the way they market it and the way it's, uh, you know, it's creating hype uh, for a brand. The, the effort they actually put into every sport that they are, it's, it's, it's really big. No, but and the they, they the support red. athletes from a really yeah. young age. Yeah. yeah. Like when did and you they start build them up. When did you start it with them? 14, 15. Oh. Yeah. I was really young. And, uh, but yeah, like all the sponsors that I have, they really uh, believe in sports, uh, sports marketing. And I think that's like the new uh that's the new billboard that's the new uh tv advertisement you know it's that's where the future is going because more in, you know every sport it's it's growing every year yeah and, you know sports entertainment is a is a one of the, i feel like it's so fast growing you know everyone nowadays watches sports you know everyone nowadays watches a new sport every year yeah. there's and so many new businesses around sports there's like so many new businesses yeah there's, it's i feel like it's a it's just starting right now you know although sports have been going forever something about our generation i feel like we're engaging more with um with sports so yeah it's uh, it's been amazing to to work with so many great uh brands because uh we all speak the same language we can all talk about uh how you know we can do a, a collaboration during, during the next event or with another athlete or stuff like that it's really cool how no. do you make this like how do you take these sponsorship decisions like based on based on i mean for me it's based on uh Obviously, my person, my I, I listen to myself first. It's you know, do I, do I, I feel, do I like putting myself with this brand? Do I like putting myself next to this company? Do I believe in the brand? Do I believe in the company? Do I believe in their vision? Um, and then uh, obviously from there, it's it's about the support too. You know, what kind of support are they going to give me? Are they going to uh, obviously? You don't want to be with a company that's just going to give you a check every month and and you don't know about them. No, you want to be with a brand that engages with you that help that you grow with because you know obviously what the goal of the those brands are is to grow with an athlete yeah. and so i want to make sure that hey we're growing together i, I make i want to make sure that i'm helping the brand too how can i help the brand how can the brand help me and it's a very uh, open relationship open uh, conversation and that's kind of how my process of you know each brand that i have on my board that's how it kind of goes and like uh, working with so many respectful brands like do you remember remember any commercial that you are like, whoa, this this is insane what we have been able to do here? Like, well, there's uh, there's been a few. Um, I did one with Beats that I really liked. I did a really cool production with Beats maybe three, four, five years ago, three, four years ago. I think um, it was really cool. It's a cool storytelling that they did. They have a really uh, cool production yeah. team that they made a kind of the story about uh, me and my dad. It was only a few minutes long. It was a really short commercial. But it, was, it went super big in Japan, super big in the Asian market. But it was a really, the way they shot it, the way the efficiency of it was actually really cool. We hired like this giant, giant uh, diving pool and did a shoot inside there. And it was, we shot overnight and the production was insane. Um, I did a really cool one with Visa once uh, in a wave pool that I'll, I'll never forget. 
for me it's about um it's not so much about the the end product Mm -hmm. because i know everyone does a great job with end product but it's about the process of the middle of it you know how how they set it up how you know people are working you know there's so many talented people on set making these uh production these commercials and uh it's so cool to see everyone just doing their part no one oversteps no one no one understeps it's just crazy uh organization and to see that happen it's like wow and then you see the product you're like well this is I, I was doing that because you you told me on the previous meeting we had this morning that you you even know how to edit in final cut and you you are like your own content creator and creative director as well like yeah at the end of the day i mean I, i'm in a generation where hey we're we're um, we own and we're the ones that are putting our image out there to the world you know so i was i'm a huge fan of uh of content creation um i, I took a course on final cut Uh, on Lightroom, I, w- I love under- understanding when I watch something, watch a video, I like to see the little details of, oh, that's really cool the way they cut this or the way they put this, oh, the coloring is so unique on this one, or, you know, I-, I love to see those little details, so um, I guess I'm just a fan of, uh, of, of post-production and, and um, that's kind of another little hobby that I have, I guess. That's so cool that you, you get involved in that because that You, I can sense that you are like involved in that when I go into your profiles. So mm-hmm. it's, it's very cool. Yeah. yeah, and maybe you know, moving out, outside of the commercial professional, moving a bit more on your personal life. Um, let's let's start with something like you know, food and, and, and cooking. What's your what's your favorite type of food? Favorite type of food? I um, I would have to say Japanese food. I think a couple of people agree here. Yeah, I think Japanese food is pretty Japanese good. Japanese right? food is very good. It's yeah. pretty good. I I went to Tokyo uh-huh. and I went uh, skin to Niseko, like powder skin. Mm-hmm. There's no like Real snow. T- to my neck, like crazy best experience ever. And what, what, at what night I was know? having sushi all night, so it was like perfect time ever. Yeah, he knows. My parents cook super good, so it's insane, man. Yeah. Insane. Like so every time we travel to California, we stay at Keno's place, obviously, and his parents. They they love cooking, so they cook for us almost like every night, and I always end up coming. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it comes back like a, a fucking ball. ball. Like, <laughs> it looks like a bowling ball. He goes home because it's it's insane. Again, his dad was Do a restaurant sushi, manager, yeah. so he knows about it. Like he, it, they cook really really good. But all around sushi or or all Japanese, 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 Japanese food is very yeah, white. People yeah. just think of yeah. sushi, but it's actually and the I don't really like sushi that much. Chicken no? katsu. Yeah. Chicken katsu is like yeah, breaded chicken, 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 special chicken. But that's wait. that's a Japanese plate. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think the more traditional one is uh, pork katsu. Right? Pork katsu, yeah, but yeah. but whatever katsu. we do, chicken katsu. I mean, his dad does it, and it's insane. But wait, but I'm I'm curious that like obviously I'm Japanese, so I love Japanese food. But as a Spanish, as a Portuguese, do you guys like, is that your favorite food? Is your own mm. own 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 no. cuisine? It, if I go international, if I think international, I mean being Portuguese and being very patriotic. No, you can say your own food too. No, no, no. I'm saying being, <laughs> to be being, honest, though. being being. Uh, I love Spanish wines. I love bro. Spanish wines. I love the style of tapas, you know, and we have similar tapas that's called well in yeah. Portugal. So I love that. But you know, think international, and every time I want, it's Japanese food is, is right up you there. You don't have I mean. to say it because I'm here. It's okay. The Japanese <laughs> okay, fans then, will then understand. Okay, then actually uh, going. I actually hate <laughs> Japanese food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. No, no, I, no. I really love. It and and uh, you know I grew up all over the world and definitely everywhere you go the best restaurants are or some of the best restaurants are Japanese restaurants and you know again we were talking about it yesterday Tokyo it's the, the city or if not the most one of the most uh, with the most uh, Michelin star per square meter or something yeah. so I mean it's for a reason right so we all have to agree there uh, but you know being Portuguese no, I have to say it's the best food speaking of Michelin stars I mean come on like in, in, for in me, Spanish it's for me I have a big dilemma because. If you want, if you need to choose a food for the rest of your life, for me it would be Spanish because you have like a Pinches. bit of everything. Got it. But for example, if you go on a date, like for a nice date that you want nice food, I would choose sushi or like Japanese. I love it, you know. But like with Spanish food, maybe definitely Iranian not food. pasta for a date. It's not very <laughs> logistic wise. It's a bit complicated. Yeah, it's huh? a bit heavy. <laughs> no, but like yeah, there's something about Spanish food that you guys hear that's like I don't know. It's very very unique like the the pinchos are like you can put they put like the most random stuff Whatever. and it makes sense though but they 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 have a vision you know yeah. they all have a vision there's a plan behind behind, There's a plan behind it, but, it's, but it's kind of chaotic you know you see like a like a piece of bread with like octopus bacon and cream cheese and you're like wow is this supposed to be good and then you eat it and it's like oh wow that's me yeah, my, my yeah, favorite stop when i go like surfing to osegor is like stopping san sebastian for pinchos 
It's, I think San Sebastian for me it has the best food in the world. Nice. And, and do you have you know before competitions or something you know on, on the preparation side any specific plate let's call it or, or you know or meal that you you like to have you know to, to, so you so you feel you're there you're ready. Uh, you no, know? no, no, that's no, that's the morning. My sm I have a smoothie every morning, but for dinner it's kind of like I just I need to eat something. I I love going to bed like full, like heavy. <laughs> Okay. I don't know, uh, so like anything huge that pasta, huge pasta, <laughs> huge rice, carbonara. whatever. You know? Before going to sleep, that's a bit too much, no? That's my favorite. Yeah. That's what he loves. Yeah. So you roll, you just roll into bed. Roll into bed, like, day, and then the <laughs> next day, it's like, yeah, you. No, it is true that you know, people, you know, big athletes like marathon runners, bef the day before they they have to take an extra set of carbs and stuff, yeah. and it, and then the next day you're. I guess it yeah. helps you sleep as well. Like, right? Yeah, go. for me, like knocks me out a lot. Of food. Yeah, yeah, for sure, it doesn't Food allow coffee. you to move much. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. That's sure. And then I, go uh, in in any other sport you know, we i know you like golf but you know any other sport as well or why golf is this something that is like a hobby these days or i don't know it's kind of a uh, it's annoying me i feel like everyone's uh, it's like everyone's uh, hopping on the trend of playing golf but i started playing yeah. golf when i was maybe uh 11 12 yeah visionary <laughs> what's the handicap what's the handicap <laughs> <laughs> one of my uh mentors when i was growing up was kelly slater and he he always played golf so it was kind of like uh, our little time together um, oh, nice. and, and whenever I went to an event or whatever, he'd always say, hey, can, can play some golf, whatever. And, oh, okay. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to be playing with someone good when, you're, when your level is bad. So I was like, yeah. oh, I'm going to get good. And then naturally I got really into it and got very, very hooked on golf. I played a lot. Didn't you have a coach at yeah, some point? I had a swing coach for, you know, I had the swing coach swing twice coach. a week. Like, um, but and then it was almost like, wow, I'm... Yeah, you're spending a bit too much time. I spent <laughs> so much time on golf, and obviously golf is not a sport where you play 20 minutes and you leave. Yeah, it's, exactly. you know, it's a sport where you put time, it's four or five hours a day, and, it's, and it's, you know, it takes a lot of your day. So between school, uh, surfing, and golf, I just didn't have enough. It, was, I only oh, so had, it goes back. That back, far, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah okay. So I didn't have enough time to do all, all of it, you know, so I had to kind of cut back a little bit. Um, and then I kind of almost burned myself out from playing golf. So it was like a... A cool, actually, lesson for me, when I played so much golf and so intensely, you know, I would play golf, I would go home and watch videos of golf yeah. the rest of the day. You know, and it's like, I, but I'm serving for a living, I have sponsors, I'm traveling the world. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, there's a, something to be, t you know, learned here that, hey, you can, you can overdo something. Yeah. So I, I kind of thought of that every time I'm, you know, I'm feeling a little bit tired from surfing or whatever, I'm like, okay. You know what? You have to turn it off sometimes, and that's where for me golf is like my right nowadays. I use golf as like my Excellent. getaway. Yeah, yeah my yeah, And I guess golf I is uh, <laughs> golf is a, a safe sport to have as number two, right? Because less injury and risk now, yeah, compared, yeah. right? So I guess that's why you see as, as well nowadays a lot of athletes that are not not golfers having golf as that second. Uh, sport and you know that passion has resulted into stuff like investing. You know, I think that's that's funny to sp speak about tomorrow sports, which was effectively our first investment together yep. that you came with apex and that's how we introduced to you apex tell tell us a bit about that side right you know again i know why you invested in tomorrow because you're so passionate about golf but why do you think it's important for you as an athlete as well to start investing but particularly in sports yeah i think uh, i mean obviously you know tomorrow sports was a great gateway for me it was a uh, I mean, thanks for for you know presenting the opportunity to me it was it's something mm -hmm. that um, you know, to this day, you know, I, I feel really um, happy to be a part of something like that, you know, to see it grow, see, to see a startup growing like that, to see it evolve. Um, it's really cool to see. You learn a lot just from being a part of uh, something like that, you know, you know, it's not a classroom or it's not a, it's not someone that's teaching you something. It's about just watching something naturally happen and you learn by asking questions. You know, I ask you guys questions all the time, like, hey, what's this? What's that? What's that? And now I feel like, you know, I, I'm really confident of, uh, of what I'm doing in the, in the investment, but I feel like it's really important to, to be a part of something that you, you trust and you have a passion for. Um, obviously, obviously um, after surfing, golf is my biggest passion, so um, it was natural for me to be a part of something that had to do with golf, had to do with something futuristic, you know, is bringing basically technology into a, a very old sport like golf. So it was exactly. kind of freshening up a, a sport that was needing that kind of uh, youth, youthfulness. And I feel like, you know, for me, I, I'm still 25. I feel like I'm still very, um, I guess, fresh. Uh, I have a fresh perspective on, on, on sports in general. So 
the idea when you presented to me when it was like, hey, you know, golf, technology, game show style, two hours long, sharp, yeah. quick stadium. I'm like, of course. But, but I love that you say that because that's exactly, you know, what, what we want, right? Is you understood what Tomorrow Sports wanted to do, right? And that's why, you know, as investors, as athlete investors, uh, investing in sports um, is, is important because you, you get it and you can be, you can be helpful. How has that experience been for you, right? Uh, you know, feeling that you're, you're in your investments, and I know definitely not to, uh, tomorrow sports only, you have Aura Ring, you know, but how has that experience been for you? How have you developed uh, as, uh, you know, uh, as we were saying in the beginning, as a, an athlete platform that beyond what you're doing, of course, you know, as a surfer, what are you doing outside? How has that experience been for you? And what's, what's your plan really going forward? Yeah, I mean, really, it's just... Um It's about, I mean, I, I realize how important it, it is to, to grow your portfolio. And obviously I spent most of my, when I, I was growing up, it was like focus on surfing, focus on results, focus on training, and you can, you can figure everything out after you're done with surfing. But nowadays as I grew up and I matured, I understood, hey, I'm actually in the middle of my career, maybe just before the, the I'm, I'm, I think I'm you know, four years away from my peak, World champion. Yeah, for, you know, I still have. So I'm, I'm not. Even, I'm not even at my peak yet. I'm still going up, and I'm going into something that maybe a lot of athletes would go post career, um, and that's something that I, I realized that hey, like I, I'm at. A, it's almost going to be like, like right now is a great time for me because the only thing I have to focus on is surfing, you know. And maybe when you're 30, 35, 40, after your career. People don't realize like that's when you yeah start a family that's when, yeah yeah and that's when you go into something that's actually probably a lot more difficult than surfing you know I, I for me I get like uh, people say like hey you have to wake up early you have to go to the gym and surf whatever I'm like man it's dream it's a dream like I get to surf twice a day three times if I want to mm -hmm. three times if I have time four times if I have time <laughs> and then go to the gym I love going to the gym because it's towards my goal so you know there's 24 hours in a day so any other minute I have outside of being in the water in the gym, I want to put it into something that um, will set me up for the future and will and push and, and give me something where I can put it back into my surfing. So it's not, you know, a lot of athletes, you know, I guess complain about I'm not having enough time, not having enough time. It's like, well, if you, and I and I've realized it's like if you really want to think about not having enough time, that's you know, when yeah. you have a family and kids, that's really not having time. Yeah. And, and just on that and you know I, i love what you're saying which is again it's it's the base of, of apex but through as well tomorrow is when we began to speak more and then when joao got involved and you know and as we were saying in the beginning joao now is also um helping apex and, and part of our business development team joao what has been you know your experience of course through canoa's eyes initially a lot and you know how important that side of the world is for him as an athlete mm -hmm. uh but also now that you're you know you're with us what's you know what have you seen that you know, has really you know changed the way you look at this you know and why again you joined us why why well again i mean i feel i joined because i felt like uh, i could bring some some added value to the team and because i really believed in the project again i started i starting i started collaborating with apex because of canoa obviously as pedro reached out to me to present us this deal initially and then i think our relationship just grew organically i started helping you guys And yeah, I think it it all makes sense now. Um, it's, it's great, just kind of the the, the blend. Again, the we're all here for a reason now. So exactly, it exactly. just it works. Show. Yeah, it works. Yeah. And in in that note of investing, surfing, this lifestyle uh, that you are getting into, like you are exposed. Like nowadays, sports and entertainment is booming, and you are exposed to so many things, impacted by so many people. And it's, I think it's hard to focus in stuff or like in great investments and things like that. Like the other day, I I went into your Instagram and your on your last reels, you have a comment from Mark Zuckerberg, the founder <laughs> of Facebook. Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> yeah, who's that guy? Yeah. So, how do you deal with all this? Uh, yeah, being so exposed to all these uh, distractions and network and, and all this, and how do you canalize into real things? I mean, you're you're the you're the master of um, content creation and and, and obviously uh, and helping me gr uh, grow my my platform. 
and you you didn't you left the most important part out where you said, really, I can't believe you didn't reply back to him." Yeah, yeah you're, you're I, I didn't want to say it now. Yeah. You got a, a comment from Mark Zuckerberg, and there is no reply from you, <laughs> no like from you. Like there is something missing, eh, Antonio. We have. Uh, I like, to, uh, some yeah, cool stuff that can be done here. Play, but playing hard to get, I, I, I get it. It's game, yeah. It works. It works. It's all a game, right? Yeah, it's all a game. We all know. You are game. trying to play it. Uh, yeah, we uh, all know the game. Feel like when you are with a girl and and you step back, you know, don't reply. Yeah, exactly. It's like gaming. You have to bring it into the to business world too. No, no, no. But I mean, you know, uh, you know, having a having a team around me, you know, that I that I trust in, that I believe in. That's, uh, I guess, the most important thing at the end of the day. Um, I think all I can speak on behalf of all the athletes. Uh, our main engine is is our sport, you know, and we want to focus on on our sport as much as possible. And there's so many, you know, I guess uh, branches off of our sport that it gives us opportunities for. And we want to make sure that everything else is is covered and settled and with people that we trust. And then so when we're in the water competing or when we're on the track or whatever, we can just focus on the job at hand. So that's kind of I think. Uh, where the future of sports is going is that um, you know better performances by having everything else covered by people that you you trust. And if if you get like an investment proposal or something, will you share it with with Apex and like or if you get like proposals from other side, you share it with your team. Like how do you? Yeah, for do sure. I mean, for me, uh, we said we have so we're exposed to so many um, opportunities like that, like you mentioned, and you know I want to make sure. Yeah, and I'm not going to be the one that I get a proposal and I'm not going to sit, you know, for, for two hours looking at a, a legal, uh, uh, the legal side of it because, you know, sometimes it's like language that I, that I don't even understand and this is where I know that when, hey, these guys tell me that, hey, I can, yeah, it's good to sign, it's good to go ahead, do you believe in the product? They ask me a couple of questions, I ask a couple of questions and they, they advise me and we set it up and that's kind of, you know, it, it's, a, it's something where I can sign uh, sign something and I can walk away and go surf and I don't have to be in the water thinking well I I hope there wasn't anything weird in the contract or I hope you know I hope I'm protected you know I don't I just I get to yeah. focus on, on surfing it's a partnership exactly right and that's that's also how you know how we we want to work with with all the athletes but it's exactly that we we believe you in many ways for for your industry insights many many of the stuff investments we look at we need to there's a lot of claims that sometimes companies and founders tell us that we use actually athletes to tell us, you know, listen, that doesn't make sense. That is a problem for surfing, maybe, but I can tell you right now, surfing doesn't give a shit about solving that problem. Mm. And, you know, this is insights that we get from you guys. And then we, of course, give you our understanding of, you know, this is the best way to do the deal. You know, we, 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 we look at the legal stuff. It makes sense. We look at the way the deal is structured. So it's, it's a partnership, you know, and that's, that's the beauty of this. That's the beauty of, what, you know, why the four of us are here. Uh, and maybe, you know, to, to end the podcast, well, I think Guzman has a cool round of quick questions for you. Quick questions. <laughs> you have Let's to be it. sharp yeah. like when you are going to land a trick and you okay. fucking land it. Okay. So, yeah, let's go. It's 10 quick questions. Uh, so yeah, if try to reply fast, okay. please. Uh, okay. If you never became a surfer, what do you think you would have been? I would like to be a CEO of a company. Okay. I don't know why. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say content creator. <laughs> no, no, actually, you know what? No, I would like to be a golfer. I think. Ah, nice, great job. Any phobias? Uh, I get, I'm super ticklish. <laughs> tickle, I touch him tickle all the time just to annoy him. Like just a touch here, and he, you almost—it's like my phobia. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like, I, someone could be, like be trying to like kill me with a knife, and if they tickle me, it's like more powerful than like a knife. So if there's a shark in the sea, he better not tickle you. If he tickles me, I'll <laughs> give then you go and charge pipe, but you can tickle. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, what's the most random item you pack when you travel? The most random item I pack when I travel. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty simple. Like, I'm like, there's there's all the recovery shit that he travels with. I guess. But it's not it's random. It's nobody's judging. Wow. Nobody's you judging. Do you have a random item? Think, or no? yeah, he's <laughs> yeah, got a exactly. random item. Yeah, random item. I think a random item uh, that I travel with everywhere. Wait, hold on. I can answer this in a good way. Um, you must have no, something. You take the, some, whatever for recovery, Japanese little bags. It's weird. Or you can do. That's not random. A spon- stuff is ra- you can do no. a favor to your investment of Aura. You pack your Aura. Thing. But that's not random. <laughs> is that I have, I have I, everything. No, you know why? It's because everything that I take, I feel like it's a necessity. It's like a. 
it has to make sense. Nothing, nothing is random. Nothing good is random, I think. I think which is a good thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's good. Good reply. <laughs> Do you have more confidence when you speak in Portuguese or Japanese? Uh, it depends. Because in Japanese, I'm used to speaking with uh, like media. So if I'm, spe if I'm doing interviews and if I'm doing uh, media, I, speaking Japanese for me, it's like very smooth. But then in Portuguese, like when I'm speaking with like my friends and like slang and street talk, or whatever, it's like Portuguese. So it depends on the situation, but it's 50 50. We don't say a word in English to each other. No, or Portuguese. Just right now. And, yeah. I, and I doubt in Japanese too. Japanese, we have a Japanese, yeah. yeah. No, sometimes. Yeah. sometimes. I I no, actually, I, I, I sleep talking Japanese. So that sometimes you'll hear me speaking Japanese when I sleep talk. So. Nice. Uh, if you could be at any concert right now, who would it be? Concert? Yeah. yeah, we all know the answer. Bad Bunny. Bad Bunny. Yeah. Is Pleno that your malo. Spanish teacher? Teacher? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's malo. So when I yeah, so it's like when I speak Spanish, everyone's like, "Wow, you have like a you speak like Bad Bunny. You have like a reggaeton accent." <laughs> so that's a song we shouldn't miss. What? A song that we shouldn't miss. A song that no one should miss. Uh, I would say um, Bad Bunny has a song that he made that no one really knows. It's it's called Corazon. It's Corazon. like a little yeah. It's a, a very good song that kind of talks about. I like he represents his country, and so and that's how I can relate to him. Is like I love to represent my country um, to the world, you know, Japanese culture to the world, even though no one understands it. Do you have those lyrics but, on a board? Yeah, for I that have, song. I do. I do. Yeah. Have and before, yeah, I have this question. Like before, you understood Spanish. Would you translate the song to understand what he's saying, or like? Yeah, I would. I would. And right. and there's a lot of, a lot of lyrics that like even. Like they have the Puerto Rican slang, you know, so and so it doesn't make any sense. Like, like in, in Spanish, they say like when you're drunk, they say like una nota. But it's, mm -hmm. uh, in Puerto Rican, they say una nota. But it's like in, no one understands what's una nota, you know, it's just like it's a no. But it's like there's things that you translate and I'm like that doesn't make sense. But then you learn it from the street, you learn it from other people, you ask people that are from there. It's like, okay, that's what that actually means. So sometimes Google Translate isn't the best teacher. <laughs> even, even Spotify, he's listening to the song while checking the lyrics. Usually yeah. when we're on the call. Yeah, true. <laughs> cool. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, dead or alive, who would it be? I would love to have dinner with, um, with Michael Jackson. I would love to understand his way of yeah. how he thought. He's, he was like the a genius behind him. Yeah, right? he was like a crazy maniac genius behind him. And it would be kind of cool to understand how he thought. Sick. If you could only take one item to a deserted island, what would it be? One item to a deserted island, I would say, I mean, assuming that I can figure out getting food and stuff there, I would say, uh, put your cell phone. My iPhone, I think, yeah, yeah. my yeah. iPhone. I'm being stuck, yeah, true, yeah, my iPhone. And then you out, no? And then Joao, yeah, 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 yeah. Or Bernardo. Or oh, Bernardo, yeah, so you can, so can film me surfing. <laughs> What's a hidden talent that nobody expects from you? A hidden talent that no one expects from me. Honestly, I think it's like the, the languages that I speak. I think no one, no one, everyone looks at me, they just see like a Japanese guy and I think they would mm -hmm. never expect me to even speak English. And then I speak Portuguese and Spanish. That's so kind of like yeah. no one. Really, so of, it's four languages yeah. you speak? And so different from each other. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So like French, Portuguese and yeah. Italian, Spanish. It's like, okay. Japanese, the wild card. Yeah, I have to keep up then in my language skills. Yeah. <laughs> Who is the coolest contact on your phone? The coolest contact on my phone? Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's cool, actually. Um, <laughs> that, that was sketchy. <laughs> I, I, actually, yeah, I, actually, no, no, I actually have a few cool ones. Uh, but I probably have a couple that if I, if I, if I say, I'll get in trouble. Um, you don't have to call him right <clears> now. Or or her? Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg is a cool contact. Yeah. yeah. You have his phone? Yeah. Oh, nice. Should we FaceTime him? Should we see what he's doing? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Hey, he's he's probably sleeping in LA still. <laughs> no, maybe he wakes I'm up at yeah, 5 a.m. Yeah, 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 no. He's, 5 a.m. clap, you two surfing and go to the office. Sleep. He doesn't sleep. No, but that's a cool contact. And, and, and finally, just to fit, wrap things up, and instead of asking you a question, give us a question that you would like us to ask uh, or you would like the podcast uh, to ask the next athlete 
that comes here to shaping legend. The next athlete, you didn't give me, you guys didn't give me time to uh, to think about this question. Um, we don't know what, what would you ask him. What would you yeah, ask him yeah, if yeah, you were? If I, would, you were I would ask them. I would ask them. Um, well, if they've ever surfed and if they haven't, why they have never surfed, and if they have, if they liked it and what they liked about it. Okay, we'll ask it. We'll ask that. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I think we have a little present for you guys. I know you. Oh, nice. You love golf. And these are good for, for golfers like us that we don't play super good. So the more golf balls that we can get, the yeah. better. <laughs> awesome. Should... Thank you. Yeah. Wow, cool. That's epic. It's Thank amazing. You. Let me see. Thank you so much. It's quite cool. Nice. Now you would need a bit more than that, right? Yeah. yeah, he's gonna, yeah. That, that would last five minutes. You need a 24-pack <laughs> for him, but that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank that's good. Guys, so that's a, yes, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah.